Hey everyone, today we're going to explain the key terms for period 7 of AP U.S. History. This would be a great way to either start the unit or review before a test. Many of these terms come directly from the College Board framework, so are likely to be vocabulary seen on AP exams. First, we're going to start off with a loaded term, imperialism. Within this term are many subterms that need to be explained. First is the closing of the frontier. By 1890, the Native American Wars were over, and the U.S. government dominated what is today the lower 48 states. An important question was being asked, should America continue its expansion in Latin America and overseas and take a seat at the table of great powers like Great Britain and France? A widely held racist idea of the time was that of white man's burden, which summed up is the belief that Western European nations and the U.S. had to civilize the world through imperialism. There were also a group of politicians and newspapers that were very nationalistic and pro-imperialism. They were known as jingos. Keep in mind, though, there were also anti-imperialists, like none other than the famous Mark Twain. This imperialism fever, supported by yellow journalism, ushered the U.S. into the Spanish-American War, in which the U.S. defeated Spain and took over many of her possessions, including the far-off Philippines, of which the U.S. would be engaged in a horrible war against its population that would sour the American public on imperialism. Emerging with the first presidents of the 20th century, there were three influential approaches to foreign policy. The first being Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy, the idea that a big and modern navy and overall military can intimidate other nations and put the U.S. in a favorable position. Taft focused on utilizing the economic colossus America had become to sway nations into pro-U.S. positions. And finally, Wilson's administration brought forth moral diplomacy and used that as a reason for entering the U.S. into World War I. It is stated that the U.S. must make the world safe for democracy. All three of those foreign policies the next couple of topics cross over between periods 6 and 7, so they may sound familiar. Progressives were middle-class reformers, many highly educated, that sought to apply the principles of their profession to solving the problems of society. They had a strong faith in progress and the ability of educated people to overcome societal problems. Brought up earlier as an example of both the social gospel and progressive movements, Jane Addams and the Hull House movement is a definite need-to-know and a push. Beginning in Chicago and then spreading to cities across the country, Hull Houses had the goal of aiding and Americanizing immigrants. They had classes taught of English and American culture and also provided other social services, including meals and children's services. The Sierra Club, still operating today, was founded by John Muir in 1892. Muir and the organization are well known for their efforts to preserve natural spaces. They advocated the setting aside of specific areas to become national parks in which Americans can enjoy for their beauty and recreation. So one thing to make note of is the difference between national parks and national forests of which there are many and cover vast swaths of the land. National parks are more in line with Mir and the Sierra Club's ideas of preservation. The land is an end in itself and should not be exploited for commercial gain. National forests have two goals. They share the park's goal of being a place for recreational activities, but they are also managed for industry as well. So in a national forest, you might see areas of logging and cattle ranching. Muckrakers are a group that crosses over between social gospel movement and the progressive reformers. Muckrakers were investigative journalists who wrote long-form pieces for magazines and books. They exposed government and corporate corruption. A great example of this was Ida Tarbell's History of Standard Oil. They highlighted terrible living and working conditions, like the already mentioned How the Other Half Lives, and Upton Sinclair's famous work, The Jungle, which I highly recommend. And they worked on civil rights issues, one of the most famous being is Ida B. Wells, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law, in all its phases. There are a lot more topics for the progressive movements, including all the acts and actions of the progressive presidents, the suffrage movement, new amendments, and the 1912 platforms of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, all of which are important, and the links to those topics are in the video information below. But we're going to keep going, moving through period 7. The Sedition and Espionage Acts of 1917 and 1918, not to be confused with the Alien Sedition Acts of 1798, limited freedoms during World War I. The war was not universally popular, and there was a segment of the population against it, including leading socialist Eugene D. Debs, who would be arrested and sent to prison for protesting it. The act covered a range of activities, but most notable for a push is the limiting of free speech. Any opinion that cast the war effort or government in a negative light could and would be prosecuted, which leads us to the important Supreme Court case of Schneck versus U.S. Charles Schneck delivered leaflets that made a statement against the draft, he was arrested and charged with violating the Espionage Act. Schneck took his case all the way to the Supreme Court, saying that the Espionage Act violated his First Amendment right to free speech. The Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, decided against Schneck. 
Justice Holmes stated that in wartime, the government has special powers that could limit rights and that speech that posed a clear and present danger could be limited and prosecuted. The end of World War I brought about the famous Treaty of Versailles. At the meeting in France, the United States was in a strong position to shape the treaty in the post-war world. As an example of Wilson's moral diplomacy, he brought forth his 14 points plan that included radical ideas like freedom of the seas and an end to colonialism, and an international government called the League of Nations. His ideas were influential, albeit not all of them were adopted. The League of Nations, however, was created, but in a historical twist of irony, the country that came up with the idea did not join it, as Wilson was blocked by his own Senate. Led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, the argument was made that joining the League of Nations would hurt U.S. sovereignty and its ability to act independently. Also, another point that Wilson could not win over his allies was the punishment of Germany. Instead of leniency, France and Great Britain imposed harsh economic penalties on Germany that would go on to have many negative consequences. Entering now into the 1920s, the election of Warren G. Harding as president meant the end of the progressive era, and as Harding promised a, quote, return to normalcy. However, his administration would end up becoming one of the most scandal-plagued in the history of the country. One of the most significant scandals was Teapot Dome. It involved Harding's Interior Secretary Albert Fall taking bribes from oil companies, and in exchange, he leased out government land. The Bolshevik Communist Revolution in 1917 in Russia shocked the world. Political radicals had been active in the U.S. for decades, typically associated with labor unions. However, during World War I, some had been outspoken against the war. And combined with the shock of what happened in Russia, the U.S. government, led by Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, began targeting radicals. They detained, imprisoned, and even deported radicals out of the country. Those Palmer raids, as they were called, intensified after a series of bombings by radicals, including one that targeted Palmer's house. At the same time, the U.S. was supporting Russia's white army that fought against the Bolsheviks. The communist, or Red Scare, was a cause of the xenophobia of the 1920s that in part led to the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the National Origins Act of 1924, that severely limited immigration, and the Sacco and Vanzetti case. All of those I go into more detail about in other videos that you can find in the links below. The generation that were in their teens and 20s during World War I, many of whom saw combat, became known as the Lost Generation because of the malaise after the war. Towards the end of the war and immediately after, there was a deep recession, partly because of the rapid decrease in government spending for war materials, and also the Spanish flu was ravaging the nation. Many would come to question the purpose of the war upon reflection. It would influence and in part define some of the works of one of the greatest eras of American literature and art, including figures like Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Works like Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby criticized American decadence and portrayed the death of the American dream. After a decades-long temperance movement dating back to the Second Great Awakening with famous leaders like Carrie Nation and Wayne Wheeler, who saw their goal fully realized with the passage of the 19th Amendment and the Volstead Act, which formally outlawed the sale of alcohol. While there was always an anti-immigrant aspect to the prohibition movement, many of their other goals of reducing the harms of alcohol were noble. But like many other big social programs, unforeseen consequences came as well. Crime rates and criminal activity would soar as big cities were taken over by powerful mafia organizations. And going into the mid to late 20s, the economy bounced back and the 20s roared. Many looked to spend their extra wealth on nightlife and entertainment. Speakeasy clubs popped up all over the cities, where the public enjoyed bootleg liquor and a new style of music called jazz. After the stock market crashed and in the depths of the Great Depression, the new president, Franklin Roosevelt, was looking for any tool to help revitalize the economy. Repealing the 18th Amendment with a new amendment, the 21st, brought an end to the era of prohibition of alcohol. During World War I, northern factories needed workers to both fill positions left by young men leaving to fight the war and the work orders for military necessities from the U.S. government. African Americans in the South were stuck in the cycles of debt associated with sharecropping and tenant farming, along with dealing with segregation and a hostile local white population. Many African Americans migrated to the North because they saw an opportunity in those Northern cities that were looking for workers. However, the Northern cities were not welcoming. The de jure segregation in the South was written into Southern laws, while in the North, it still existed in a de facto form, unwritten, but still known. African Americans were segregated into slums, paid less than white workers, and were the first to lose their jobs. There was a shining beacon for the African American community in the North, though. Harlem, a borough of New York, became the center of the African-American community and renaissance that saw the flourishing of African-American artists, authors, musicians, 
and leaders that produced great and influential works on a wide range of topics. In the 1920s, there were major public debates about a variety of cultural issues. First, there was a backlash against modern scientific ideas like that of evolution. This was seen most in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, in which a teacher taught a lesson on evolution in a Tennessee public school. I go more in depth about that trial in another video. Check that out below. The 1920s also saw the Ku Klux Klan make a reappearance, and this time, not just in the South. It became a powerful political organization across the country and had members of Congress in its organization. The Klan opposed anyone who did not have a WASP background or white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. They raged against all minorities and white Catholic immigrants. Religious and cultural fundamentalists also supported prohibition and spoke out against jazz, which they believed was, was the devil's music. They were also critical of America's increasing consumer culture, believing it was degrading the moral foundations of the country. The modernists basically take the opposite view of the fundamentalists on all those topics. The Roaring Twenties came to a screeching halt with the Great Depression. There were many hidden fundamental economic problems that arose in concert with each other. Some of these include overvalued stocks pumped up by margin loans in which traders used to buy stocks on credit. There was also an increase in protectionism across the world, which hindered trade and economic activity. New products like radios and toasters were not flying off the shelves anymore, and inventories rose. For most farmers, the 20s were never roaring, as commodity prices remained low after the end of World War I. By the time of the Great Depression, many were losing their farms to debt. With the declining ability for consumers to pay their loans and suspect operating and lending practices, banks across the country started to fail, and those citizens that were frugal and built up their savings saw all of it lost. The long-term effects of the problems were devastating and the U.S. would not fully get out of the Depression and high unemployment until World War II. A compounding problem during the Great Depression was an ecological disaster called the Dust Bowl. Farming the Great Plains had always been difficult with a lack of water and lackluster soil, and when several years saw drought conditions, the topsoil dried up and became sand. With few trees or other obstructions, the winds of the plains whipped up great sandstorms that swept across the country. Much of the land was now useless to the plains farmers. Leaflets circulated around, that there were abundant crop picking jobs out in California. This drew a great migration out of the plains into the West Coast. Some found work, however, there was not enough of it, and camps sprung up around California of destitute migrant workers. Steinbeck's classic novel, The Graves of Wrath, does an excellent job of covering the plight of the migrants. In the depths of the Great Depression, a new president was elected on a platform of economic relief, reform, and recovery. Franklin Roosevelt would operate very differently from his predecessor, Hoover, or any other president before him, by pushing through Congress a myriad of government programs that saw the government directly involve itself in many economic areas. Programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps employed young men in various conservation projects. Social Security provided direct welfare to the elderly. The National Industrial Recovery Act pressured companies to sign on to various government policies like reduced hours and increased pay. The government now insured banks with the FDIC, and there are many other programs as well. Along with the programs, FDR gave weekly fireside chats over the radio, explaining what the government was doing, and this lifted the spirits of many Americans. The New Deal did have some positive effects, but it could not fully pull the U.S. out of the Depression, and it would fundamentally change the relationship between the government, economy, and citizens. While the U.S. was focused on the internal problems of the Great Depression, Overseas, trouble was brewing with the rise of totalitarian regimes. Some were fascists like Italy, Spain, and Germany, and some were communists like the Soviet Union. Both limited the freedom of its citizens and extended considerable control over many aspects of life. They also heavily used propaganda to both support their regimes and make scapegoats out of individuals and groups of people they blamed for the ills of their countries. World War I loomed a heavy shadow over U.S. foreign policy, as many did not remember it favorably. The public, harkening back to George Washington's farewell address, wanted the U.S. to stay out of European conflicts. Some say this leads to the 20s and 30s being an era of isolationism. However, there was some engagement, including the U.S. organizing and leading the Kellogg-Brand Act, in which signers renounced aggressive wars, the Washington Naval Conference meant to reduce armaments of the major powers, and Roosevelt had a good neighbor policy with Latin America, in which the U.S. would attempt to end meddling in Latin American politics and help to forge mutually beneficial relationships. However, FDR wanted to do more to combat the spread of totalitarian regimes, but he was hamstrung by the public and Congress, which passed a series of neutrality acts that limited what FDR could do. He did find ways around the acts to aid Great Britain 
with the Lend-Lease Program. In the late 1930s, Nazi Germany and Imperial Japanese armies were on the move across the globe. Back in the U.S., many wanted to make sure the U.S. did not get involved. They set up the America First Committee, an anti-war organization that ballooned to hundreds of thousands of members. It was headed by possibly the most famous celebrity in America, Charles Lindbergh, the aviator who flew across the Atlantic and was also involved in a famous trial of a man accused of kidnapping and murdering his son. The committee set up rallies and gave speeches across the entire U.S. In their speeches, they insinuated FDR was steering the country towards war, and sometimes the speeches made anti-Semitic claims about Jewish conspiracies. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the America First Committee would quickly fade away. There were many, many nations involved in World War II, as it was truly a global fight. However, the seven major powers were Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, Imperial Japan on the Axis side, and on the Allies side were the United States, Soviet Union, China, Great Britain, which includes places like Australia and India in its empire. World War II, like its predecessor World War I, but even more so, would be a total war, which meant it involved the entire social, political, and economic might of all nations involved. The entire military and civilian populations were a part of the war effort, and also war would be waged against them as well. Cities were bombed and destroyed until they were unrecognizable anymore. Infrastructure and civilians were targeted, and everyone knows of the horrific atrocities, including the Holocaust, the rape of Nanjing, and the millions of others that would die in prisoner of war camps. While hailing in comparison to the totalitarian regimes, the U.S. did curtail rights and targeted specific groups for special treatment. Japanese American residents and citizens under Executive Order 9066, were relocated to internment camps from their homes. They lost their livelihoods, most of their possessions, and their rights. Korematsu, a young Japanese man, had originally evaded the roundup of Japanese in California and hid out. Eventually he was found, but Korematsu sued for his freedom, saying the executive order went against the Constitution. His case went all the way to the Supreme Court, who decided against Korematsu and in favor of the order, saying that in wartime, the government can take away rights, relocate, and intern people. Towards the middle and end of World War II, leaders of the United States, Great Britain, and Soviet Union, along with other allies, met at conferences to discuss both the war and what would happen after the war. Here, we see the beginnings of the United Nations, which would be a second try at international government, this time with the United States taking the leading role. There were also discussions and plans made about dividing up Germany and holding free and fair elections in liberated countries. However, those elections ended up being far from free and fair, as the U.S. and Soviet Union jockeyed for influence and puppet governments that would support either side. The war and period seven would come to an end, and a new atomic age would begin with the dropping of atomic bombs. During the war, the U.S. government began a massive effort to harness the power of the fundamental forces of the universe the development of an atomic bomb. Scientists were undecided if it could be done, but if so, it would be far more powerful than any conventional weapon. After years of work, it was successfully tested at Los Alamos, New Mexico in July 1945. Germany had already surrendered after being bludgeoned by Allied forces. However, Japan, as an island, would be incredibly difficult to conquer. Preparations were underway for a massive invasion of Japan that would cost the U.S. and Japan dearly in lives lost. However, the atomic bomb offered another solution to end the war. Two were dropped in August of 1945 on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, while at the same time the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and invaded Manchuria. The Japanese people for the first time ever would hear the voice of their emperor, who they revered as a god. He said that the U.S. had used cruel bombs and Japan had no other choice but to surrender. The most devastating war in history was over. There was relief but also grave concern as the nuclear age was ushered in, and atomic weapons would advance to become even far more powerful as hydrogen bombs. The nuclear sword of Damocles would hang over humanity's head, where it remains today, always 15 minutes away from the end. Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video. I hope it helped with either to introduce you to the time period or to review before a test. 